Psychology by Arthur Mecken. Mr. Dale, who had quiet rooms in a western part of London, was very busily occupied one day with a pencil and little scraps of paper. He would stop in the middle of his writing, of his monotonous tramp from door to window, jot down a line of hieroglyphics, and turn again to his work. At lunch, he kept his instruments on the table beside him, and a little notebook accompanied him on his evening walk about the green. Sometimes he seemed to experience a certain difficulty in the act of writing, as if the heat of shame or even incredulous surprise held his hand. But one by one, the fragments of paper fell into the drawer, and a full feast awaited him at the day's close. As he lit his pipe at dusk, he was standing by the window and looking out into the street. In the distance, cab lights flashed to and fro up and down the hill on the main road. Across the way, he saw the long line of sober gray houses, cheerfully lit up for the most part, displaying against the night the dining room and the evening meal. In one house just opposite, there was a brighter illumination, and the open windows showed a modest dinner party in progress. And here and there, a drawing room on the first floor glowed ruddy as the tall, shaded lamp was lit. Everywhere, Dell saw a quiet and comfortable respectability. If there were no gaiety, there was no riot, and he thought himself fortunate to have got rooms in so sane and meritorious a street. The pavement was almost deserted. Now and again, a servant would dart out from a side door and scurry off in the direction of the shops, returning in a few minutes in equal haste. But foot passengers were rare, and only at long intervals a stranger would drift from the highway and wander with slow speculation down Abingdon Road as if he had passed its entrance a thousand times and had at last been piqued with curiosity and the desire of exploring the unknown. All the inhabitants of the quarter prided themselves on their quiet and seclusion, and many of them did not so much as dream that if one went far enough, the road degenerated and became abominable, the homes of the hideous, the mouth of a black purlieu. Indeed, Stories, ill and malodorous, were told of the streets parallel to east and west, which perhaps communicated with the terrible sink beyond, but those who lived at the good end of Abingdon Road knew nothing of their neighbors. Dell leant far out of his window. The pale London sky deepened to violet as the lamps were lit, and in the twilight the little gardens before the houses shone, seemed as if they grew more clear. The golden laburnum, but reflected the last bright yellow veil that had fallen over the sky after sunset. The white hawthorn was a gleaming splendor, the red may a flameless fire in the dusk. From the open window, Dale could note the increasing cheerfulness of the diners opposite, as the moderate cups were filled and emptied. Blinds in the higher stories brightened up and down the street when the nurses came up with the children. A gentle breeze that smelt of grass and woods and flowers fanned away the day's heat from the pavement stones, rustled through the blossoming boughs, and sank again, leaving the road to calm. All the scene breathed the gentle domestic peace of the stories. There were regular lives, dull duties done, sober and common thoughts on every side. He felt that he needed not to listen at the windows, for he could divine all the talk, and guess the placid and usual channels in which the conversation flowed. Here there were no spasms, nor raptures, nor the red storms of romance, but a safe rest. Marriage and birth and begetting were no more here than breakfast and lunch and afternoon tea. And then he turned away from the placid transparency of the street, and sat down before his lamp and the papers he had so studiously noted. A friend of his, an impossible man named Jennings, had been to see him the night before, and they had talked about the psychology of the novelists, discussing their insight and the depth of their probe. It is all very well as far as it goes, said Jennings. Yes, it is perfectly accurate. Guardsmen do like chorus girls. The doctor's daughter is fond of the curate, the grocer's assistant of the Baptist persuasion has sometimes religious difficulties. 
Smart people no doubt think a great deal about social events and complications. The tragic comedians felt and wrote all that stuff, I dare say. But do you think that is all? Do you call a description of the gilt tools on the Morocco here an exhaustive essay on Shakespeare? But what more is there? said Dale. Don't you think, then, that human nature has been fairly laid open? What more? Songs of the frantic lupinar delirium of the madhouse. Not extreme wickedness, but the insensate, the unintelligible, the lunatic passion and idea, the desire that must come from some other sphere that we cannot even faintly imagine. Look for yourself. It is easy. Dale looked now at the ends and scraps of paper. On them he had carefully registered all the secret thoughts of the day, the crazy lusts, the senseless furies, the foul monsters that his heart had borne, the maniac fantasies that he had harbored. In every note he found a rampant madness, the equivalence in thought of mathematical absurdity, of two-sided triangles, of parallel straight lines which met. And we talk of absurd dreams, he said to himself, and these are wilder than the wildest visions, and our sins, but these are the sins of nightmare. And every day, he went on, we lead two lives, and the half of our soul is madness, and half heaven is lit by a black sun. I say I am a man, but who is the other that hides in me?'